GM is moving out of New York, Ford's moving out of Australia, and Bob Lutz is trying to bustle in on Fisker. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone. Your journey, our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 197 for May 24th of 2013. Cruise Diesel, 50 MPG at 50 MPH. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 2200 GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or by following the links on our website. Hey, Jan, how are you? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for running the show last week without me. Oh, it was fun. I mean, I think it was a good show. Yeah, no, I heard good good stuff about it. And we've got Gary Vasilash back with us. John, how are you? I'm doing well, Peter? Gary. Gary. Yeah. Dapper Peter. Thank you. Peter's in a suit and tie because he's going to have to leave a little bit early in the show today. But we got him for right now. So let, let, let's get into some of the news this week. What did you all make of GM announcing it's going to move its treasurer's office out of New York City to Detroit. Well, it's a significant move. Um, every GM chairman up to, as you said, Rick Wagner, has come through that office. Um, and I think it's significant, but I, I think it, it really signals a new era for GM because, you know, it's kind of became uh, irrelevant to have that office, and now they're consolidating everything in Detroit. I think it's... It's probably good for the company. I agree. I think it makes total sense, but but it is a historical change sure. because, uh, to your point, Peter, you know, Alfred Sloan really had uh, really established the office, and, and and really it was it was the de facto headquarters of General Motors. You know, yeah. he never worked in Detroit. I mean, he'd come visit. But the chairman of General Motors did not work at the General Motors headquarters on West Grand Boulevard in Detroit. He was at the treasurer's office in New York City. And that was the career path. You, almost all of them graduated from the Harvard Business School, were recruited to the treasurer's office, and uh, put in about a five-year stint there, and then they'd be sent out. That, once they were properly prepped, then they were sent into the rest of the company. Yeah. So it, it, it does... Strike me though that um, New York, Wall Street, publicly traded company. I mean, it, it, isn't there something to be said for being in that milieu rather than being in Detroit? You know, way off the off the radar for a lot of these. Yeah, people. I think what it's saying is it really it's saying it really doesn't matter anymore that they're there. That things are so different that uh, you know. They can move on. Maybe it's because they went bankrupt. It's just like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> We're consolidating the office. I hear what you're saying, Gary. You know, that is the financial center of the world still, or one of the big financial centers. But by the same token, maybe your finance guy should be around where the rest of the company's uh, sure, doing everything, sure. too. So I understand the move. Well, I think this like, has a lot to do with Ammon. Dan Ammon. Dan the Ammon. CFO, yeah, right? That he just thinks it's better to He wants his people right where he is. Yeah. Well, it's it's, it's sort of interesting, um, sort of related but unrelated. Um, So BMW has this affiliation with the Guggenheim Museum in New York, and uh, I noticed that they came out with a... uh, 100 Urban Trends, a glossary of ideas. So, So they went to New York, they went to Berlin, and they went to Mumbai. And they came up with a list of what people were talking about. And so they um, presented this. And it's very interesting to me that in the 100 terms for New York, there's not a single one related to cars. Okay? Not one. And now, what do you mean? Explain it. Not, well, I mean, not one term. Of, yeah, so, of so basically they have, they have a variety of terms here. 3D printer, the 99% accessibility, accessible health care, affordable housing, aging population, and it goes all the way through to urban systems. This is in New York, right? And so then when you go to the one in Berlin that you see 
you know, some of the similar um, terminologies that they're talking about. I mean, it's 3D printer accessibility design, active transportation, activist citizen, but electric car, emission reduction, uh, future of parking, you know, in, in Berlin. And then you go to Mumbai, and there's one, um, it it's, um, doesn't start out with 3D printers, it starts out with the 74th Amendment, whatever that is, and, um, but 10,000 honks, because apparently this guy is, is suggesting that cars should only be able to beep their horns 10,000 times. But they, they go through and they have auto rickshaw, bus rapid transit, informal transit system. But you know the whole point being that New York, where they're moving out of, is a place where the urban conversation is not about cars. It's not about the auto industry. Mm. So it's, you know, it, it's all yellow taxis, apparently. Yeah, mm. strange. And, you know, with uh, GM's moving its treasurer's office out of New York, uh, what's your reaction to Ford announcing it's moving its manufacturing out of Australia? Well, apparently they, uh, they, they import all the cars to, that they're going to sell. They're going to continue to import cars. They'll still, still be in the country selling, yeah. right? But, but they there. just couldn't uh, upgrade what they were manufacturing there to meet the new regulations, apparently, and just said, we're just going to import cars. And it's so, probably less expensive for them to be producing in other Southeast Asian markets yeah. and, and bringing them in. But, you know, then you got to ask yourself, well, what does that do to the reception of that brand in that country when they've been there for so very long and then they go, well, can't afford to do it anymore. See yeah, ya. it's, it's yeah. probably not a great image thing for the company. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to cripple them. It, it'll hurt, hurt them for a while, but I think the Australians will get over it ultimately, as long as Ford's got great, good product, and it does right now. You know, the, it's sad, though. What everybody has to remember, however, is that uh, for so many years, for so many decades, Australia was essentially a closed market. They protected it with very high tariffs. I want to say it was a, a decade, a little over a decade ago, they started opening up the market by reducing tariffs. And what everyone has to remember is Australia is a country of only 20 million people, mm -hmm. give or take. It's about the same as Ohio and Michigan put together. And their market's only 1.1 million vehicles a year? I don't even think it's that, Peter. I don't even think it's that. It's smaller than the Canadian market. Can Canada is what, 37, 38 million people, something like that, almost twice the size population-wise. And so when you let all these imports in by reducing tariffs, uh, and then you reduce the sales accordingly of the domestic producers, that pretty much, uh, you know, put the writing on the wall. The difference, of course, is GM Holden's still there, but Holden exports cars all over the place. So uh, I think that's how they're going to keep the volume to stay there at least for a longer time than Ford is. Of course, yeah. remember, the, remember the Capri that was exported from Australia here? Yeah. Yeah, the little roadster. Yeah. That was a terrible car. But, I mean, there, there was a time when Ford was doing the same thing. They tried. And, and so They tried. But, you know, uh, oh, that car fell apart in front of your eyes. I mean, if it had been a good car, they would have had a fighting chance at mm -hmm. it. And, uh, you know, the, the Australian Utes, you know, sort of El Camino kind of versions of the Ford Falcon and uh, the Holden Commodore are awesome vehicles. That's what they should have brought over. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, gosh, this goes back uh, about 14 years ago. I had an Australian Ute right-hand steer at the Dream Cruise. I could have sold five of them that afternoon. And it's funny because people come running up. They go, what car is it? What car? They go, hey, what's with the steering wheel? I said, ah, oh, they made a mistake at the factory. Put it on the <laughs> wrong side. It. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, to me it's kind of sad to see uh, the end of an era for the Australian automotive industry. Yeah, yeah. And what about Lutz? Trying to move in on uh, Fisker here with his uh, VL motors. Well, he was already stuffing Corvette engines in the Fisker. The, the Karma. The VL Destino. The Destino, which sounds vaguely uh, Dean Martin, Las Vegas. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> I thought it sounds like some Simpsons episode of, uh, you know. The future car. The Destino. But, you know, when you pull all the batteries and stuff out of the Fisker and just 
put the Corvette motor in it, it's, I guess it's pretty, pretty good. And they changed the grill or something like yeah. that too. They didn't, yeah, a, a little bit of stuff. Yeah, yeah, they did a little bit of stuff. I, I don't know. But you see, he called it quite, quite possibly the most beautiful four-door sedan ever. Of course, he's selling them. What, what else is he going to yeah. say? I think it's, it's a nice looking vehicle, but it's massive. It's a massive vehicle. I don't find it as beautiful as everybody else does. I don't To me, it, it's got this sort of, you know, if you remember the Beatles' Yellow Submarine uh, um, animated yeah. movie, the grill reminds me of a grin from the meanies. <laughs> so I, I, I've never warmed up to the car. Yeah. But, he, but he's hooking up with the, um, the, the, the um, Chinese battery. Wang Shang. Yeah, the battery company. So even though he's, he's putting those Corvette engines in. It might those be elec bands. electric in China. I, well, I, th I think because he, he'd made the point. Um, so he writes a blog on Forbes.com. And in that blog, he was talking about, you know, the, the plant in, in Delaware is too big and don't even think about that, move that out of there. And doing it in Finland um, is is too expensive, don't do that. You know, I mean, and so it sort of, sort of seems to me that what he was intimating, and this was, this was like six, six weeks ago that he was writing this, okay? It seems to me that what he's intimating is, is that, gee whiz, you know, if only we had this most beautiful sedan ever and we had it produced in, oh, a low-wage country that they would have batteries, hmm, China. <laughs> and then you could sell them for, you know, a fraction of uh, what, what, you know, mm. Fisker has to charge here. Mm. Does he have any chance? Does a car have any chance? I don't think. I mean, because he's char he, first you got to buy the Fusker, and then you you pay them an enormous amount of money to put a V8 in it. I don't know. You got to really want it bad. I, I don't see it. I, I, I don't either. I, I just don't. Well, see I mean, if you, but I mean, if you buy, I mean, if they buy the company out of bankruptcy, so you get it for a song. You get it for a song, and then you have the car, and you have the. And tool. that helps. That helps a lot. You don't have to put a whole bunch of capital up front, but you still got to sell those suckers, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I, I'm just not convinced. But what if? There's... But what if? What if there was a Fisker, an, an electric, you know, or, or well, it's a it's an extended range electric vehicle. Let's, right. We got to remember that. That's right. Not a, not an electric. Not an electric car, but um, so let's say you have one for sixty thousand bucks, and and couldn't. Couldn't his plan be, gee, I can, I can compete with the ELR? That probably is his plan, but, I, you know, who's selling these things? You know, you only sell cars by having the dealers to get you the sales volume. I, I, are all the Fisker dealers signed up with VL Motors? I don't think so. How many, so. Are, how many of those exist? I don't know, but the ELR is a better-looking car. <laughs> it is. I, I agree totally. <clears throat> What's your take on uh, Tesla repaying the loan and the big controversy with uh, well, Chrysler? Well, look at his stock. Jeez. Well, first of all, I mean, the fact that Tesla is the darling of the media is unbelievable. I mean, they're just, they're talking about Tesla like they're talking about Ford or GM. Uh, you know, let's review mm -hmm. how big this company is. And then, of course, Tesla says they're the first American car company to pay out the loan. Then Chrysler gets their Linguini, Linguini out of joint and says, oh, well, wait a minute, we paid. But, and then Elon, rightly so, I retweeted his tweet, which is rare. He said, excuse me, but you're an Italian-owned company. You're not an American company. Absolutely right. And everyone wants to forget about that, but it's no longer an American company. So. Well, I think they were still American when they repaid the loan. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless. Um, anyway, it's getting on far more attention than it deserves, my, my opinion. Tesla? Uh, I'm not so sure. I mean, uh, it, it's getting too much attention. I'll give you that. And well, all the media that knows nothing about the business, it's, they're all they think gaga. this is the second Yeah, time. they're all gaga over it, which is a, is a bad sign. So. Yeah, we could probably park all the Teslas in the lot outside and you know, still have room. I don't know. You know, they're they're on track to sell twenty thousand plus this year, which is better than anybody else is doing. And and these things are going out the door at a hundred thousand bucks, so uh, that's pretty good. And I but thought it was like okay, but that's you know if if we just look at it as as the numbers for pure electric cars, okay. And to, so I mean, didn't the aforementioned Volt sell like twenty four thousand last year? No. First year it did. Oh oh year. oh. Um, Second year might not. You might be right, Gary. You might be right. 
So it, it might have done that much last year, right? So they're they're doing okay. They're doing okay, but remember, uh, you know, volts are going out the door under forty thousand. Teslas are going out at a hundred thousand plus. But getting back to your question, I thought it was brilliant of them to pay off the loan. You know, the stock price has gone crazy. And a, and a key reason why it has, too, is that all the bears on Tesla shorted the stock. They were sure this thing was going to crash. And in point of fact, it didn't crash. And so they had to cover their shorts, and you cover that by buying stock. <laughs> so the bears actually, the, everybody shorting the stock helped drive it up even more. Still clearly hoping that the thing's going to crash, and, and I'm with them. I think it will at some point, but it might take a couple of years, and usually you just buy options out at a couple of months at a time. So I, I thought uh, it was smart for Elon to say, hey, look, we got the money now. Boom, boom. Let's, get, let's just take care of this thing. Now, nobody can come after us that, you know, we're just a vassal of the government. Well, I mean, he's, he's a P.T. Barnum with the media. He, he gets it. He knows how to manipulate the media. But here's the one thing everybody seems to be missing the point of. Yeah, they made a profit in the first quarter. They lost money on operations. They did not make their money selling electric cars directly. They got it two other ways. Every time you sell an electric car in California, you get a credit, and you can sell that credit to other car companies that, by law, have got to either sell EVs or have these credits. They claim, I, or I think Tesla said, 12% of their revenue came from selling credits. I think that's exactly where their profit came from. But, and, and this is where they do get a lot of credit, too, uh, both Toyota and Daimler license their technology, have taken stakes in the company. So uh, the, the key will be by the end of the year. Even Elon has admitted we're going to run out of credits by the end of the right. year. So then we're really going to see. Well, the, the key will be if he puts money in product development. OK, mm -hmm. you, he can't be a one trick pony with with the Model S. I mean, it's 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 got to be more than that because that would not be sustainable. And they've got a Model X, you know. Yeah, coming. but 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 to your point, uh, I, th I think they just bought themselves a lot of time. If, if they can cash out this stock, you know, they paid off the government 400 million whatever it was. If they can take another 400 million and put that in product development, now you're talking. They, mm -hmm. they could do that, and they could get another model just off the stock bump, right, which, not which, even worrying about making so, a profit on so the to, company. So to see if they're a serious car company or not, or if this is something else. Yeah. Peter thinks it's something else, I think. I think it's something else. I, I think they're serious because, as we've talked about on the show before, you can't go from zero to Motor Trend Car of the Year in one shot and not know what the hell you're doing. I'm not saying Elon did that, but he hired people who knew what they were doing. That, he hired people. The car is awesome. It really is good. He hired people from Detroit. That's right. I mean, do they want to be like Ferrari and sell 5,000 cars a year at... 100,000 plus, 200,000 plus. If I were him, that's what I would do. Trying to do mainstream, I don't know. No, I, I think what he wants to do is sell 20, 25,000 a year for a couple of years, post quarter, quarter, quarter of profit, and then sell it to Toyota, to Daimler, or whoever else shows up. I think Toyota will buy it. Why? Because it already has a T in the title. Ooh, there you go. A Toyota Tesla. Thank you, Akio. <laughs> <laughs> or you're welcome, Akio, whatever. And uh, Viper going back to Lamar. Let's, let's be clear about Viper going back to Lamar. They got certain uh, adjustments from the American Lamar series to run because when they showed up at Mid Ohio, they got spanked. Well, they were four seconds a lap off. Of course, when they ran at uh, by by Petit Le Mans and Sebring and at Laguna recently, they're right on point. Why? Because they've got adjustments. When they go to Le Mans, they won't have those adjustments. Oh. They have to run the ACL rules. So, so get ready, Viper uh, fans. They could be two seconds a lap off the pace. Ouch! And at Le Mans, you're, that's dead. But but what do you think this 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 says about what they're trying to do for for SRT? By putting that, I mean, is it is it is it meaningful or is it uh, just? Well, you know, I don't know. it's it's meaningful as an, a halo uh, for the company, but uh, it's how they leverage it. 
You know. Well, look, you know, Viper's got a, a strong story to tell about success at Le Mans. You know, they, they, they ran there for years. And, you know, look what, at least amongst hardcore sports car buyers, Corvette running at Le Mans has done for them. It's maybe not so much in the United States, but definitely in global markets. That's really helped establish the Corvette brand, and I think Viper's trying to do the same thing. Of course, you have to have some success to build that kind of heritage. And uh, if they're going to be two laps uh, or two seconds a lap slower, uh, that, that's going it, to, it's not going to happen this year. No, no, don't expect it to happen. And then the Corvette team's got that awesome augmented reality uh, technology in it where instead of a rear view camera or a rear view mirror, you've got a rear view camera, which the, with this overlay on the screen that as cars are coming up at, you during the night, whether it's in the fog or the rain or what, it, it identifies what class yeah, they're in. It tells them P1, P2, GT. Right. Which, how fast they're closing, what side they're going to pass on. And, uh, you know, if you're running two hours, oh, here we got it up on the screen now. If you're running, you know, hour after hour on a long distance race like that, I, I think this augmented reality thing is just awesome. And maybe next year they'll all be wearing Google glasses, and so when they're looking forward, they'll have all this information. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. What about Indy? Yeah, Indy's uh, this weekend. It's uh... interesting stories. Uh, Dario Franchitti. Well, first of all. For, first of all, number one story is Chevrolet. Yeah. Chevrolet's got what? The top 11 or 10 positions? Yeah, but don't be deceived by the qualifying times because the race is a whole different deal. Huh? They did the same thing last year. Right. And Honda won. Right. So, I mean, we have some history to be made. There are only three four times, four-time winners of the race. Al Unser, A.J. Foyt, and Rick Mears. Am I missing one? No. No, that's it. And then there's a bunch of three times. Yeah, Dario Franchitti is three time. Elio, Elio, Elio Castro Neves is three times. They're both in the race. They both have a chance to win. Um, the front row is very interesting. Uh, Ed Carpenter uh, owns his own team and runs really well on ovals. Uh, that's not a flash in the pan. He's going to be tough. But I like the kid next to him. Actually, the two guys next to him. But the kid next to him, Carlos Munoz yeah. from Colombia, a rookie, rookie, blistering fast kid. I watch him because and Marco Andretti next to him. Uh, but uh, they're going to be tough all day. But so the first nine, first three rows. All right. Is, anybody it, could win. Yeah. Anybody. When was the last time a rookie won at Indianapolis? Was it Nigel Mansell, maybe? No, a fellow <laughs> Colombian, Juan Pablo Montoya, All right. who just smoked everybody. And this kid has that potential. Huh. So it's going to be interesting. And then dark horse pick, A.J. Allmendinger, driving for Penske, who qualified extremely well. Better than his teammates. Yeah. And he had just stepped into the car. Yeah. So, you know, once again, Indy's Indy. Anything can happen. And then I was telling you before the show, I hear the rumor is that Indy may switch to compressed natural gas as a fuel before the decade's out. That would be that would be pretty cool if they did that. That would be very cool. It would. And, you know, uh, they ran gasoline up through the early 1960s. To 64. 64. And they had the... Horrific accident. Yeah, when Eddie Sachs and Dave McDonald died. Uh, then they then they, they also, because of that wreck, uh, developed a fuel cell. Mm -hmm. um, they borrowed it from helicopters. Right. Military helicopters. Then they went to methanol. Right. Then they went to ethanol. Well, I think the natural gas is more a more American solution to it. Yeah. Ethanol is like the Brazilian thing going on. And compressed natural gas ha comes out of the ground at 130 octane. So blow it up real good. <laughs> well, I got I got to think though that I mean pit stops would be inordinately long because it takes longer to put natural well, gas. Well, when I fuel. when I proposed the Hydrogen Electric Racing Federation, the whole idea was hydrogen cars, well, you you can't store it, you can't fill it up. It's not safe. It gets too hot. Racing Hindenburg. was Yeah, racing yeah. was supposed to solve all that.
So if you have compressed natural gas. Actually, I don't know if it would be compressed. It's probably going to be liquid. Yeah, gas. liquid okay. natural gas. Right. But, you know, the idea of the Hydrogen Electric Racing Federation is all these problems with the hydrogen cars could be solved by the racers. Yeah. Race it. You'll the best engineers yeah. are going to figure out how to well, get Well, you'll figure going. it out. How fast you want to go or how long you want to run. And then pit stops. What are you going to do? How are you going to refill? I mean, the whole thing about refilling hydrogen fuel car and how big is that tank and how are you going to do it? Right. But the bottom line, ultimately, it was, you know, way ahead of its time. But the other bottom line is I'm not going to race when it's just electric cars with manufactured sounds, which is another part of my rules, What every manufacturer had to have a sound signature. And they were free to develop that, either by electronic or mixed with air running over pieces of the car that would make noise. You know, because otherwise it wouldn't make any noise. So, whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll be watching the race. For sure. It's always... Well, look, we ought to take a, a commercial break. Peter, I know you, yeah, you got, got another uh, engagement that you've got to get to, but thanks for being here, I'll as always. I'll be here, and I'll be back next week. And uh, we'll be back in a minute with our guest, Mike Seacrest, with the, the Chevy Cruze Diesel. So, Ben, let's give a shout-out to our good friends at Bridgestone. Thanks so much for coming on Auto Line After Hours with us. You're welcome, and thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, appreciate it very much. And just to get it straight, you're the assistant chief engineer on this program, is Ex that right? Exactly, assistant chief engineer. The chief engineer is Jens Bartha, mm -hmm. and Jens revised, uh, uh, resides in Torino, Italy, actually. And it, that's where this engine was designed? That, that's where the uh, product team, if you will, resides for the uh, engine family where this comes from. This, mm -hmm. this engine is very similar to products that we have in our uh, Opal vehicles, Astra, Insignia, Zafira, and then we modified it here, you know, from there to meet the North American requirements, of course. Mm -hmm. Where's the engine built? In Kaiserslautern, Germany. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, so Kaiserslautern. So the Germany. Opal people must be real glad about oh, that. Oh, they are right? very happy about this. Very happy and very proud to be part, part of the, the clean cruise diesel in America here, too. Yeah. So is this the most international engine that you're aware of? I mean, I if you got it in Torino and you guys were working on it in Pontiac? Oh, yeah. And no, I, uh, building it in Germany? I don't know if it's the most international, but it's certainly very international. In fact, everybody had a, a little piece of the, the project here. The base engine, you know, is, is, is done in, in Torino. And by the way, I should mention that's our center of expertise. Mm -hmm. For small diesel engines within within GM, is There's, that left over from the Fiat GM thing days? I don't know if left over, but it sure had taken form from that. Okay, gotcha. okay, yeah, it, it certainly took took form from from those days. And there's multiple engine families that are designed and developed out of Torino, but from there the the, the, the comes the base engine. All the specific parts of the hardware for for the engine were designed in Pontiac. We did all of our dyno development and uh, validation in Pontiac, and all the vehicle calibration was done in Milford. Hmm. Yeah, so it was it was it was quite a global project. There's also uh, several engineers that are in Rüsselsheim at Opel mm -hmm. that that have uh, hardware responsibility for the engine. Also, this is a cool engine. We've got a cutaway in the studio here. Yeah. And I, I love these cutaways because you can see inside it. And I was knocked out. I don't know why. I, I shouldn't have been surprised at all. But it's twin cam four valve. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Twin cam four valve, uh, steel crankshaft, iron block, aluminum head. Yeah, it's, it's, it's... Direct injection. Direct injection, yes. Which is what you got to do these days, You absolutely. Right? In fact, the direction, the, the, the injection system is, runs at 1,600 bar. We use PZO. High and, pressure. Very high pressure. Is that higher than what you would run this in Europe? No, that's, that's that's the same. We really have engines in Europe that run at two different uh, fuel rail pressures, one at 1,600 and one at 2,000. So, so translate that. 1,600 bar is oh what in PSI? Yeah, no, I, I, that, you don't yeah, know. I, I, I don't, I don't okay, know. Okay, just for our viewers, go find it online. And <laughs> what you can do is 1,600 times 14.7, basically, right? Okay. So that, that, that's, so, a, mm -hmm. that's a lot of PSI. Very high pressure, absolutely. Yes. Uh, you know, we're burying the lead here because, Which is. because um, as I mentioned earlier, that Josh Tabel, who was on the show in February, came up to me today and he said, you know, you guys haven't talked about the fact 
46 miles per gallon highway, yes. which is better than, than any, hybrids, than, yeah, them. I mean, it's, 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 yeah. the, it's the most uh, MPGs of any non-hybrid vehicle. 46 yes. miles per gallon is the best fuel, highway fuel economy label of any non-hybrid vehicle in America, in North America, which is an extraordinary uh, feat in itself. I, and Josh told me that as well today, and I, I thought, no, oh, come on. We must have talked about that by now because it's it's really great. No, what he told us on the show is it's more than 42. Oh, That's yeah. exactly right. And then <laughs> and because 42 was Volkswagen. And so these guys now have Trump them. Yeah. By four miles a gallon. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's nothing it's, to sneeze at. That's nothing, pretty good. nothing to sneeze at. I'm sure that I, I don't have any uh, specific feedback, but I'm sure that that's gotten their attention. <laughs> 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 I'll bet it has. Now, I'm sure you've driven this a whole lot. Oh, my so, goodness. So just as, you know, there are hybrids that have very good label numbers, they're not that good in the real world, some of them. How's this in the real world? This performs very, very well. I mean, will I see 46? I do every week. Oh. You know, I drive back and forth to Lordstown frequently. Mm -hmm. Which is where the car is, is being where, assembled. Is where the, the vehicle is, is being assembled, and I will regularly get 46. And, John, I, I really don't drive very slow. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> all right, if we I, like you a whole lot better already. All right, if I'd slow down a little bit, I'm sure I would get uh, much better fuel economy. And the fact of the matter is the diesel... Maybe beat 50? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to speculate uh, okay. too optimistically, yeah, yeah. but I, I think that's within the possibilities, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, um, the diesel inherently, by the physics of the engine, really does very, very well under sustained load for, for BSFC, for fuel economy. It really does very... In fact, I was with um, Mike Anderson... Uh, and, and, and Gary, hopefully you got a chance to drive the uh, uh, 2.5 liter Impala today with the new trick valve train Actually, in it. I didn't. But okay, so, sorry, sorry that, that was another. But Mike and I were talking today about how well it does for uh, BSFC under sustained load compared to a gas engine. Yeah. So we should translate. Uh, brake specific fuel consumption, BSFC. Just, right. just so anybody watching, if you don't know. Right. We don't want to make it too op opaque. So, so where would the sweet spot be for this engine? So somebody is going to buy the cruise diesel and they, and they want to get optimal fuel efficiency. Where, where, where would they be in terms of their speed range? And, and if I understand your question properly, at what engine RPM would the sweet spot be for fuel economy? I mean, it... it, it Not just RPM, it'd be speed too. Yeah. But... You know, 45 miles an hour. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it, it's difficult to answer that, that question clearly, you know, but, uh, I mean, the, 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 the drag on the vehicle, as you probably are well aware of, changes as the square of, of the vehicle speed. So I'm not really sure, Gary, exactly where, where the sweet spot would be. But if you would run it at 50 miles an hour, you would be amazed at the results. I mean... I'll bet it would get 50 at 50. Yeah, in fact... Uh, there's a uh, competition going in, going on within our building. There's what's it called a Game Boy screen on the on the vehicle, and it will show what your best score for fuel economy is over uh, either a 25, 50 mile, or 500 mile range. And so one of the guys had the idea that let's let's have a competition. Let's see who can get the best fuel economy. And I don't know if they're cheating or not, but it doesn't matter, right? But I don't know if we got Suburbans dragging around cruises around the circle track at Milford or whatever. But the guy that's winning so far, so far shows a 50-mile best score of 62.8 miles per gallon. Yeah. yeah. Ow. And he, you know, he was, he was intentionally trying to create the best score, but that'll mm -hmm. give you an idea. But that, that counts. You know, yeah. uh, the, well, I, 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 the I, hybrid I, guys hypermile and brag well, about I, 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 saw, I saw a screenshot on a, on a smartphone of one of your colleagues today, right. and, and, and there were two figures on, on the screen. One was a long distance. It was Average, the, the, right. And, and the other one was the 25-mile one right. that was just set today on the way to the event, uh -huh. and both of those numbers were well above 50. Right. Whoa. So, 
I, I again, I regular, I've, I've driven my uh, the captured test fleet vehicle that I'm driving for over 10,000 miles, and I regularly get what the label says. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. And the other outstanding thing about this is, you know, everybody focuses on the highway fuel economy label, but the other incredible thing is, is the range you get out of this vehicle. I mean, it's over 700 miles, and we also do that regularly. We have our, uh, uh, actually, this young lady uh, works for Josh Tavel, and I happened to recruit with her at the University of Missouri Rolla because we both went to, went to engineering school there together. She lived, her family lives in Arkansas. She drove to Arkansas and uh, drove five miles an hour below the speed limit and got 900 miles out of a tank wow. of fuel. Is that incredible? That is incredible. Now, I, 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 don't, I don't know if that's meaningful to you or not, but I think for a lot of people in the marketplace to, to get that kind of range, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a, a huge advantage. It mm -hmm. is. Yeah. It sure it is. Now, now, one of the things that I think is, is interesting about this engine is the fact that, um, you know, although it, it started basically in, in Italy, mm -hmm. um, that you guys had to do a lot of work to make it suitable for sale in the United States. We, we really did. And it was really focused on four main areas. And this is just uh, what the engine was developed for Europe versus what it needed to be developed for the US. And the four areas were exhaust emissions, the much more stringent standards here. We added the SCR system on it to, to, for NOx reduction. Uh, diagnostics. As you both are well aware, the diagnostics... Uh, OBD2, right? Oh, my goodness. It, it's, it's a tremendous challenge. And on a diesel, it's a huge tremendous challenge to, okay. to do that properly and do, do it well. Um, uh, fuel economy, obviously. And then the environmental conditions that the vehicle operates here are quite different than, than what they are in Europe. Much hotter and much colder. Right? Very, a lot hotter. I mean, we don't, they don't have to drive a car at 130 degrees F in Death Valley and, and climb out of, you know, out of, out of the hole, et cetera. They don't have to start on the Minnesota um, Canada border at minus 40 degrees C. You know, I mean, the, the vehicles expect to do that. And they don't have paved roads uh, up to 14,000 feet like we do in Colorado on Mount Abbott. So all of that had a huge impact on, on the development process of what the vehicle had to do and what the, what the engine had to do. I give a lot of credit, by the way, for the, uh, the huge success that the, the vehicle and the drivability uh, in, in the way the, the vehicle drives to our, our development system manager. Her name is Becky Dar. She's a very, very talented, talented person, and she, she did a great job helping us to develop this product. Of course, the problem with everything that you just described is that adds a tremendous amount of cost to the engine. Some people are running around saying it adds 5000 bucks to an engine. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. I can't comment on, on the exact cost of right. all, all what all that added. I know but some have said that. My my understanding would be more like three. I don't know, fifteen hundred to three thousand. Yeah, John, I, I just can't speculate on that because I really don't have a have a number in mind that it takes. There's certainly the urea system that's that's in the vehicle, a tank, a pump, right, uh, an injector, et cetera, a catalyst. Did you absolutely need to have that to meet the the emissions? Cause I thought with a smaller displacement diesel, two liters or smaller, that you might be able to get by without that. There's a couple of reasons why this was this was the right choice for us. Okay, is this will clearly enable the emissions compliance now and into the future. And the other thing it is, is it, it, it's the play for fuel economy on the highway. This is, a, a compared to the other choices, it, it's a much better play, play for fuel economy. Gotcha. We're able to calibrate the engine and control NOx at the optimum fuel economy. Gotcha. Yeah, so that, that, that was the idea, and that's why we did it that way. So if, if somebody goes to Europe, rents a cruise diesel over there because it was like 35,000 were sold last year, I think the number is, in, in Europe. Um, and they were to drive one here, would it be discernibly different from the work that you guys have done? Oh, I think the character that we developed the, the cruise diesel here would be, would be quite a bit different. 
So more Even, refined? I think much more refined, much smoother, much more linear with the, the throttle progression and the, the pedal map. In fact, I was talking with some of the other writers today uh, about that fact. They're very familiar with the, with the European products and they, they agreed that we're much, much more uh, picky the customers are much more picky about what, what they expect. And that's not only the drivability of the engine, the throttle progression, but as well as the transmission calibration. We have one of our partners from, uh, uh, from Opal that did the uh, transmission calibration. Because you have an automatic. We do. Whereas every, everybody in Europe is going to have a manual, they're, they're pretty all, much. They're all manuals. Yeah, this is a six-speed Eisen automatic. And, uh, but but our, our calibrator, he, uh, we... we uh, we made him work. <laughs> we made him work. We he and and at and the, forty below and one hundred and twenty oh, yeah. f and, and the, twelve thousand feet. And, yep, and the result was very good. But he really had to work for it. It really it really does a good job of uh, transmission shift quality and the map. And we really we worked hard to optimize not only for drivability and drivability metrics, but also to get the N over V down in each gear as far as we could to make it uh, be the best we could for fuel economy. Hmm. So, did you spend a lot of time benchmarking other diesels when you were working on this development? Our direct competitor was the Jetta. I mean, we, yeah. we, we put our sights on it, you know, c clearly put our sights on it, and that, that's what we developed it. And the result is, is that we're higher in horsepower, we're higher in torque, better highway fuel economy. I believe it's much better integrated into the vehicle, the NVH level. Uh, to, to the driver is, is very, very good. And I challenge anybody to go drive the two vehicles and, and let, us, let us know how it went. In fact, I w you, did you have a chance to, to drive the cruise today? No. Oh, darn. I was really interested in, in, your, in, in what you had to say about it. But yeah, it's the, the, you know, most of the riders that, that I rode with today, um, their first comment is they couldn't believe how quiet it is. From the driver's seat, it is very, very quiet. And we put a huge focus on, on that, you know. It's nearly transparent. You can't hardly tell you've got a diesel until you're at idle. Then you, you, can, you, can, you can hear a little bit, mm -hmm. right? So you, you hear those high-pressure injectors. Uh, well, it's, it's the inherent diesel uh, combustion sound, sound that you hear. Now, uh, conversely, you know you have a diesel because it's got so much torque and it is so fun to drive. It it just jumps right out at you. Yeah. Yeah. Next year, I think it is. Europe goes to Euro Six emission standard. It does. Is a lot of your lessons going to translate back to Europe? We will transfer a lot of those lessons back into Euro Six and into that marketplace. Now, is that going to help cost-wise? You know that that's what the guys from Bosch are counting on. They told me that. Once Europe goes to Euro 6 and they have to start using SCR and, and so many of the things used here that it, it should give them a lot more manufacturing volume, scale, and it should help cost. Scale always helps the cost. I mean, it, it, it always should, and it, it, it should certainly be directionally correct. Hmm. Yes. So just when, when you talk to people, your friends, your neighbors, your relatives, and so on, and you told them, you know, you're developing this diesel engine and it's going to go into the Chevy Cruze and... and did they say to you, like, diesel engine? What no. You, you... In, in fact, Gary, w when, when, I, when I could tell them, you well. know, when it, when, when, it, when it was released and I would tell them, they would have quite the opposite reaction. They would say, my gosh, what took everybody so long to do this? Right? Well, you have very savvy family and relatives. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, that, that must Because I know why Gary was asking the that question. Must, that must be it. No, I mean, seriously, but that's usually the reaction that I get out of people is that, Either, yeah, that's great, we really think that's a great move, or you ought to be putting it in this other vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. But both were very positive responses. Yes. i got to believe that engine would drop in a few other GM products. Well, it might. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it might. It's all going to depend on sales now, right? Well, we'll How just... the public here reacts to it. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, it, we're, we're all uh, very interested to see how the, uh, the sales are going to be and how well the the public, the market ex accepts the product, and that will drive everything, of mm -hmm. course. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll have to see. Did you guys announce today what you're charging for it? 
for the diesel? Actually, that's been that's been announced for since the uh, Chicago Auto Show oh, in geez, February. Josh was probably talking about that with us. He probably was, yeah. and and actually, I th I also think it's a great value. It's twenty five and Tom six ninety five, I believe. Yeah, twenty five six ninety five, and for, to me that that's a tremendous value. It's priced six hundred dollars less than a comparably up equipped Jetta, and. I think it's a uh, pretty aggressive. Superior, superior well, and, and things well. things were also done to the car itself to to make it suitable for the diesel by improving it in terms of the aero and and so on. So so you're getting something more with the um, diesel version of the cruise than just you know gasoline to to um, absolutely. So, so you're getting a little extra there. Yeah, many of the things were taken off of the, the, the eco crews, you know, the shutters, the aero. The aero was further improved, the rolling uh, resistance on the tires, all, all, all of those things. Yeah. Yeah. That's got you know, when talking about uh, transfer of, uh, of, of learning back and forth between the U.S. and Europe, I mean, think about G General Motors' technical strength in this area. We took a really premium product that's, that's a, you know, tried and true in Europe, okay. We took the learnings from the Duramax and we applied SER to that hmm. here in the United States, made a great product out of it. And then we'll in turn take that and turn that back into Euro 6 back in. Yeah, so it's, it, it's really, I think, a strong statement for GM's technical strength throughout the, the world to execute these new products. Well, I, I got to tell you, everybody in the business is watching this one like a hawk. It's one thing for the Germans to come in with diesel engines because they've got such a history of using them in Europe and everything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be another for a company that really hasn't had diesels in passenger cars for, what, oh, 25 years yeah. or more. 1986 in the Chevette. It was the last you remember one. Anybody remember what a oh, Chevette is? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's that's, that's the that's a first car my wife and I bought new. There you and go. And a diesel, too, Gary? No, 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 no. I can't go that far. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, I got to believe, and I've been saying that on this show for a while now, if the cruise diesel sells even reasonably well, everyone's going to jump into the pool. There's a lot of activity. There seems to be an awfully, uh, awful lot of interest o over the product, you know. And uh, we'll, we'll just have to see. At this point, though, this is, this is the only domestic... Diesel passenger car. Passenger car. It is. It's right. it's the only one. That's correct. Yeah. And that's why I say that's that's why everyone's watching this like a hawk mm -hmm. because, you know, the fuel economy regulations are, are very tight. Uh, hybrids, you know, they are a little over 3% of the markets. That's it. You know, the, the Prius does brilliantly well for Toyota. They, mm -hmm. They've got scale with the Prius. They do. But not even Toyota's all that successful, really, with the rest of their hybrid line. Nothing comes anywhere. Well, the, the, the Prius is half the hybrid market. So uh, 3%, boy, that's not going to really help the industry all that much. So if diesels can do better than that, I, I think this could really be and, and, uh, and let's the not, beginning of a wave. Let's not forget that, that Volkswagen does have the uh, diesel hybrid, so let's give them a, a little, little props. Well, and for, Volkswagen, yeah. you know. Volkswagen does have quite a bit of volume on the, in the diesel market here, here in the U.S. too. They, they've been increasing, mm -hmm. and there's, their volume is nothing to, to sneeze at, frankly. Mm -hmm. And think about what the diesel does for, for the customer. I mean, that, that's really important compared to the hybrid is that um, – the, the hybrid does what it does very well, but the diesel gives you a premium product that does some that's that's different. It gives you great performance as well as the incredible fuel economy. I mean, if you drive this vehicle, you're going to walk away and say, "Wow, this is really fun to drive." Mm -hmm. I mean, it it is really fun to drive, and um, that that's really the difference. That's great. You know, uh, we ought to. Uh, get to some of the questions from our audience that are coming in right now. That'd be great. This is the rapid fire part of uh, the program. So Carmen, let's get to rapid fire. Watch this. <laughs> okay, Mike Dwight wants to know, when does the cruise diesel hit the showrooms? 
It's already on the showrooms. Uh, we've been shipping to Commerce for about two weeks, and we've actually already sold units to customers. And he wants to know, what's the city MPG? The label value is 27 miles per gallon. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks, Dwight. Yeah. Goggles Pisano says, will a cruise diesel compete in the World Touring Car Championship? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Frankly, I have no idea. Yeah. That'd probably be hell, uh, handled out of Europe anyway. Right? I would think so, yes. Uh, Wright Knight says, will there be a V6 diesel for the new Impala or other larger models? I'm sorry, but I really am not, uh, I, I can't d discuss our future product plans here, as John, as you, as you well know. Yes. I, I like when they say those sort of things. Yeah, I, I, right, Knight, I think you're asking a good, good question there. And, and Gary just mentioned uh, a diesel hybrid at Volkswagen, and Peugeot's got them as well, I mm -hmm. believe, in Europe. What about, a, does that make any sense to you, a hybrid diesel? Yeah, again, I can't discuss it in, in, oh, in any oh. of the future stuff, John, I'm sorry. <laughs> Who uh, knows what might happen, though? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Nick says, uh, do you think the problems that VW is having with their high-pressure fuel pumps on TDIs is a general diesel issue related to U.S. diesel gas quality or a, a Volkswagen issue? I think that, I, I, I really don't know, but I think that, that the special cause that they're having problems with their fuel system, yeah, and I, I probably should just leave it at that. Okay, yeah. I, I wasn't aware that they were having an, an issue with that. They, they are, in fact, yes. Rum and Coke wants to know, what about a performance version of the cruise diesel in the future to spank those annoying VW punks? Well, in fact, <laughs> in fact, the, the VW guys are, are really... Uh, are looking up instead of down, frankly, because we make 151 horsepower for the for the cruise diesel. We make 264 foot pounds of torque, and we make, uh, or excuse me, 264 foot pounds of torque, 250 from 1750 to 3000. All three of those beat Jetta for performance. And it gets uh, zero to 60, 8.6 seconds. Correct. That's, that's a reasonable time. Anything so, at so, eight seconds in my book is good. So, so they've got the performance vehicle already. Yeah, that's right. No, no, it's got to get under eight. <laughs> I, I said it's reasonably good. I didn't say it's great. Hey, uh, we got a phone call here. Ba or Carmen, let's bring that in. Hello, this is James from Syracuse, New York. And I've got a general question. I've noticed most car salesmen are older men. What would you recommend a younger person around 22 do or say in an interview in order to convince the dealership that they can sell cars just as well as an older person? Thank you. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, there are older people in dealerships, but that's, it's not just older. Now, 22, that's pretty young. I don't know uh, that I've ever run across, not that I'm in dealerships a whole lot. I can't really say I've seen anyone that young. But you know what? It all comes down to sales ability. If you can't sell yourself, yeah. you probably can't sell cars. You need to get out and get some sort of sales experience, whether it's at a dealership or whatever it happens to be, and be able to go in and tell them, look, I've been successful at selling this, and maybe you've got some of that experience anyway. But sell yourself. I mean, if, like I said, if you can't sell yourself, don't even think about selling cars. Good point. Uh, let's see, another question here. Uh, Espo says, has this diesel engine been designed for a north-south application as well? Um, it, it has the potential to be north-south, but again, I cannot disclose anything about our f future product plans, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, timing chain or belt? It's a belt. In fact, uh, we worked hard to uh, uh, provide the maximum maintenance interval for, for this on the engine. Uh, it's a hundred thousand mile maintenance on on the belt, mm -hmm. and that's uh, that's that's w it really required a, a belt upgrade for that and a tensioner or upgrade to to enable that. And is it reasonably accessible the belt? Yeah, it is actually uh, on the front of the engine. Uh, that uh, after the accessory drive is out of the way, of course, mm -hmm. there's a there's a cover and it it comes off pretty easily. Okay, good. Yes. Good to know. Uh, and he also wonders, Espo does, for every pound of weight that you save in a car, do you, do you know what the fuel savings translate for the diesel? 
I do not. I, I don't either. I know. Yeah. I know the engineers, Gary. Maybe do you know? Isn't uh, there some there, rule of thumb? There's a. I. I I'm not going to know the right number, but yes, that the, the steel guys have had that all worked out. Yeah. And, uh, they. <laughs> I'm sure. They, they love to quote that. And, <laughs> I'm uh, sure. Uh, George from Brooklyn heard us talking about uh, GM leaving uh, New York with the treasurer's office. He wants to know: Does Chrysler have a presence in the Chrysler building? I don't, I don't think, think so. so. I don't think they've been in the Chrysler building for a long time. But I will say this, I think the Chrysler building is the most awesome skyscraper that has ever been built. Mm -hmm. I know there's there others that are taller, you know, than this and that and the other thing, but that thing is just gorgeous. It's, it's a beautiful building. Uh, George also wants to know, why did American consumers stay away from diesels? You know what, I, I, I view that as that uh, it, it's the, the right product at the right time here. The fuel prices have increased enough that the, the value that the diesel engine provides, it, it, the, the, the time the is time now. The fuel. And, you know, well, GM had some pretty bad diesels in the early 80s, too. That, that turned some people off to it. Yeah, m uh, many, many of the people that will buy this product, though, are, are not even aware that, that that occurred. And, John, this is a totally different product from, from, from the product that, that, that you speak of. This is a very uh, uh, high, highly technical product. You know, it's proven out of our experience in Europe, and so it's just... It's just not even an issue anymore. But yeah. when you guys were developing that, was that sort of like over your shoulder, you know? The, like not this, at all. This, this in fact, this. it was never talked about, frankly. Yeah. It if just... it was talked about, it was in Italian. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe the Italians talked about it. No, I'm sure they didn't even know. No, they didn't know. I'm sure I, they did. I'm just saying that to be funny. I hope it was. <laughs> hey, we got another phone call here. Let's bring it in. Hi, this is Jonathan out in Old Stand, New Jersey. Hi, My Jonathan. question is with regards to the diesel cruise. Um, is it going to be marketed for fuel mileage and and such, or is it going to be marketed more towards a sporty driving feel or both? Now, I was just curious, is there any possibility of a race series of cruise diesels as a category? Thank you very much. It's a great show. 258 pound-feet of torque. Sounds pretty exciting. Thank you. Actually, it's 264. We just released this morning the, the SAE certified uh, horsepower and torque number. So it's actually better than, than, than what we've been publishing up, up, up until this morning. And, you know, the way you have to think about this product, the cruises are already very successful, very successful uh, vehicle in the marketplace. And this is the halo for the cruise. It's a premium product. It gets great performance and amazing fuel economy. That's that's really what this is. Uh, bigger bigger than just a diesel in the market now, right? Mm -hmm. It's really a premium product and a halo vehicle for the cruise lineup, and really for Chevrolet. JM One NB wants to know: cylinder deactivation effective on six and eight cylinder diesels? Um, of course, you're work, we're talking about a four here. But. We're, we're, we're talking about a four. I am not aware of anybody working on cylinder DIAC for, for, for a diesel engine. That would be very difficult on a four-cylinder for sure. And David Arnoldson from Las Vegas says, uh, what about uh, start-stop? That, that's, that, that certainly has a potential, but again, I don't know that anybody is really working on that. The vehicle does have neutral idle which not only enhances the, the What's weight. What's that mean, neutral idle? Uh, it decouples the engine and transmission when you're at a stop. So this certainly enhances the, the, uh, the NVH of the vehicle, but oh. probably a little bit of a fuel economy savings too. Hmm. Yeah. So just, just, just technically though, would, would start stop for a diesel, you know, a, <laughs> you know compression and ignition, be more difficult I believe, than spark ignition? I believe so. And the reason why is because um, the transitions that you would go through when you both start it and stop it, are, are uh, you, you'd be more apt to feel those. Right. St strictly driven by the higher compression ratio of the engine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's what would happen. Hey, we uh, have another phone call here. Let's bring that in. Uh, my name is Clem Zorowski from Delmont, Pennsylvania. Years ago, we checked out the Olds diesel, and we found out one other problem was with it 
was the stack up of machine tolerances between the compression distance of the piston, the connecting rod length, and the stroke in the crank. And, it ver and that caused all kind of variances in compression ratio in, in different cylinders in the same engine. Thank you very much. Bye. I'm sure you don't have that problem in this one. We do not have that you, problem. You guys in this probably one. machined to much finer tolerances than you did back then. Very much so, yes. Um, let's see, we've got another one here. Eric would like to know how successful would the cruise diesel have to be to start engine production in North America? Well, that's a very good question. And, and, and uh, you know, basically we're, we're leveraging our manufacturing facility in Kaiserslautern to build the cruise diesel as well. But if the volumes uh, dictated that uh, uh, this becomes a, a, a huge deal, it's obviously a, uh, an advantage to build them here rather than in Germany. Yeah. So at that plant, are they are they building a number of different diesels? I they mean, do. They, they build this and some... yeah, this this family of engines, okay, are all built in Kaiserslautern. So the engines that are going in Astras, Insignias, Zafiras, and the cruise diesel are all built in Kaiserslautern. Gary... And and that's what they build there. That's mm -hmm. that's 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 the only engine that they build. Gary, you'd know this then. To have an engine plant, what kind of volume do you need a year to really justify tooling that up? Number of a car plant? 400,000? I mean, usually... Well, uh, it'd probably be less than that that really? you get away with it. Yeah. I, I know because in the it, old it, days, as it were, uh, it was about 500,000 you had I, I, to justify well, for a plant. Well, because, because that was back in the days of just transfer lines. Right. Okay, so yep. now, now that we have a lot of uh, single spindle CNC machines, that basically what you can do is you can start the factory and grow it. Okay. Just add, add modules. Add, add capacity. And so before, the reason you needed that was that you always capacitized an engine plant to the biggest possible number because if you had less and your demand was more, you couldn't do anything to lengthen the transfer line. That was fixed. Right. Okay. Got so it. now you can build it up as needed. So, you're, you know, so your starting volume is significantly less, which reduces your investment. So you, know, you have this greater possibility of doing that. And then the other thing that you could say is, is that, well, and if it doesn't do so well, you can reutilize that equipment elsewhere because it's reprogramming. Back in the day, if you had a transfer line to make a certain engine, that is what it made, and that was the only thing it could make, okay? So it's, it's a whole changed game now, so there would be a possibility hmm. of doing that. Very interesting. But, but given the, the, you know, the guys who are building the engines now, I mean, un undoubtedly have such expertise at that that you want to really... And, and, and they do, and they do, and that's really what we want to continue to do, at least uh, into the, the view of the future. Get this future. thing going. View of the future at this time, yes. Hey, Carmen, we got another phone call there. Hi, John, and hi, Pete, uh, Peter. This is uh, Joe Frank calling from San Antonio, Texas. I just had a general question for anyone there. Um, in light of uh, Ford saying they're going to leave Australia, the manufacturing, at least, and only being an import brand in that country, what do you think that means uh, for Holden, especially, and maybe even, I think Toyota is still there producing as well. And is that going to be a domino effect? And also, how does it kind of reflect other countries, especially the, the continent of Europe? What that would mean for other manufacturers as well. And I appreciate your comments or what your thoughts on that if you haven't addressed that. Thanks. Good show, guys. Thanks. Yeah, um, good question. I, I don't think it's going to be a domino effect in the sense that uh, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't heard anything of Holden saying it's going to pull out of Australia. And as I said before, I, I think a key difference is Holden does quite a bit of export. They send uh, a lot of Commodores to the Middle East, as an example. And, you know, the Chevy Caprice that's sold in the U.S. market is made in Australia. Uh, Toyota, I know, too, man. Too bad, too bad that whole GTO thing didn't work out very well. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> right. That's right. Um, yeah, the Toyota manufactures, I think Toyota continues to manufacture cars in I Australia. Think they do, yeah. And Mitsubishi did, Chrysler, years ago, also manufactured in Australia. And they sold that operation to Mitsubishi. But I, I want to say that Mitsubishi stopped building cars in Australia some time ago. 
So I think it's going to be down to Holden and Toyota, if Toyota's even there. And I know there's people probably in the chat room or, or listening to this who will know far more about it than I do. But that ought to wrap up uh, the show and, and definitely rapid fire. But Mike, thanks so much for coming on. And I, thanks for having me, guys. It was great talking to you about our new clean cruise diesel. I can't wait to drive this thing. And I yeah. know I'll get a chance shortly. To oh, yeah, so. you have to because it is so fun to drive. I mean, that I, 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 don't, I don't know how else to describe it. Uh, the torque uh, as you get onto the highway, for instance, is just, just incredible. All that and great fuel economy, too. Yeah. Your cake and eating it, too, right? Your cake and eat it, too. And, Jerry, great having you back, as always. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're a great addition to the show. Uh, before we go, I want to let everybody know we, we started something on AutoLine Daily. I highly recommend that you check out. Jim Hall is doing a design handbook, starting to introduce people to various uh, terminology used by designers, also design tips and that, and I think you're going to like this. But anyway, thank you all for having tuned in, and please join us again here next week. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There is all that and much more at autoline.tv.